Okay, here we are at the final frontier of the central nervous system. This video is going to be a bit of a doozy, as we'll be putting together a lot of what we've already learned. So if you haven't yet caught up on all the previous videos in the playlist, make sure to do that first. The spinal cord is traditionally divided into three regions, with the cervical spinal cord in the neck, the thoracic spinal cord in the chest, and the lumbar spinal cord in the abdomen. After the lumbar region, the spinal cord begins to thin, creating a tapered region known as the conus medullaris. The spinal cord officially ends around the first or second lumbar vertebrae. However, even after the spinal cord ends, many of the nerves that have branched off from it continue to run downwards in a cluster of nerves known as the cauda equina, which is Latin for horse's tail, which makes sense given its appearance. The nerves that exit from the spinal cord are mixed nerves, consisting of both motor and sensory neurons. While the two kinds of neurons intermingle for most of the length of the nerve, close to the spinal cord the two types separate, with motor neurons exiting on the anterior side of the spinal cord and sensory nerves entering on the posterior side. The spinal cord is not a disorganized tangle of nerves thrown together in a haphazard fashion. Instead, the spinal cord features a surprising degree of organization owing to the fact that, as in other parts of the nervous system we've talked about so far, nerves that do similar things tend to travel together. This allows us to understand and name the various parts of the spinal cord that we see. When you cut horizontally across the spinal cord to make a cross section, the first difference you'll notice is the separation between gray and white matter. Unlike the cerebrum, where the gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside, the spinal cord features the opposite arrangement, with the white matter on the outside and the gray matter making a butterfly-like shape in the middle. Within the gray and white matter are further subdivisions based on function. To understand these, we'll need to look at the various pathways traveling through the spinal cord in more detail, starting with the sensory pathways. Before we can truly understand what is going on in the spinal cord, we need to make a distinction between two different types of sensory neurons. The first type is known as a protopathic neuron and carries three specific types of sensations, crude touch, temperature, and pain. The second type is known as an epicritic neuron, which carries fine touch, vibration, and proprioception, or the sense of where one's body parts are in physical space, as we talked about in the video on the cerebellum. It's worth taking a moment to clarify what we mean by terms like touch, fine touch, and crude touch. Protopathic neurons are only able to tell if they are being touched, but they can't give much more detail than that. For that reason, we say that they can do crude or non-discriminative touch. In contrast, epicritic neurons are much more sensitive and are able to tell us whether we are being touched in two distinct locations and roughly how far apart they are. Because they can discriminate between two different points, they are said to perform fine or discriminative touch. Okay, with that background information under our belts, let's look at how these two different types of neurons travel in the spinal cord up to the brain. We'll start by focusing exclusively on epicritic neurons. Epicritic neurons travel in the dorsal column of the spinal cord, the part between the two upper wings of the butterfly. The dorsal column is further split up into two parts, with information coming from the lower body being carried medially in the gracile fasciculus and information from the upper body being carried laterally in the cuneate fasciculus. You can remember this by thinking that, most of the time, your arms are lateral to your legs, just like the cuneate fasciculus is lateral to the gracile fasciculus. For more word-oriented learners, you can also use the phrase, walk gracefully and eat with your hands, to correlate your lower body to the gracile fasciculus and your hands to the cuneate fasciculus. These neurons travel upwards towards the brain in the dorsal column of the spinal cord until they hit the medulla. In the medulla, epicritic neurons cross over from left to right and right to left, just like the motor fibers we talked about in the video on the brainstem. From there, these neurons continue their journey on a bundle of axons known as the medial lemniscus before passing through the ventroposterolateral nucleus of the thalamus and finally hitting the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. This entire pathway is known as the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway.
So if the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathways where epicritic neurons travel, where do protopathic neurons go? These sensory neurons travel via a completely different pathway known as the spinothalamic tract. The spinothalamic tract has its own way of doing things. Peripheral nerves carrying these sensory modalities initially enter the spinal cord on the dorsal side. They first enter into an area known as the posterior lateral tract or Lissauer's tract. Lissauer's tract is an interesting quirk of the spinothalamic tract. Neurons in this tract often head up or down a spinal level or two, seemingly for no reason other than to confuse medical students. This is why sensory loss related to a spinal cord injury can often be off by a level or two from what you'd expect. Anyway, after passing through Lissauer's tract, these neurons then head for the upper wings of the butterfly, where they enter into one of two areas, the substantia gelatinosa or nucleus proprius. Unlike the nerves traveling in the dorsal column, which wait until the medulla to cross over, the nerves in the spinothalamic tract then immediately cross over after entering the spinal cord in a bundle known as the anterior white commissure. They then ascend in the spinothalamic tract upwards towards the brain. You can remember this by thinking that non-discriminative touch, temperature, and pain are not that patient and want to cross over immediately, while fine touch, vibration, and proprioception are feeling very patient and are fine waiting until the medulla to cross over. After crossing over in the anterior white commissure, the nerves in the spinothalamic tract travel upwards in the white matter surrounding the anterior horn of the spinal cord, with the information from the lower body being carried more on the lateral aspect, while information from the upper body is carried more medially. Take a moment to note that this is the opposite pattern of what we saw with the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway, where information from the legs was medial to information from the arms. From here, the spinothalamic tract travels upwards to synapse in the thalamus before reaching its final destination in the parietal lobe. And that's the spinothalamic tract in a nutshell. Now that we've covered both the sensory pathways, we will now shift our attention to the motor pathway that makes up the other half of information flowing through the spinal cord. The vast majority of motor signals travel through the spinal cord in the corticospinal tract. The corticospinal tract is divided into two parts, the lateral corticospinal tract and the anterior corticospinal tract. The lateral corticospinal tract is the larger of the two, accounting for around 90% of all the motor neurons traveling in the spinal cord. In general, motor neurons going toward the upper extremities travel more medially, while those going to the lower extremities are found more laterally. This follows the same pattern as the one in the spinothalamic tract, and the opposite pattern of the one in the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. When it comes time to exit from the spinal cord, these nerves synapse onto motor neurons in the bottom half of the butterfly's wings, known as the anterior horn, before exiting from the anterior side of the spinal cord. So let's look at the overall path that a motor signal takes from the brain to the muscle. From the motor cortex in the frontal lobe, the signal travels downward into the medulla where it crosses over. From there, it travels in the corticospinal tract in the spinal cord before synapsing onto the anterior horn. From there, it exits the spinal cord as a nerve and travels to the muscle that it innervates. If you've made it this far, use your lateral corticospinal tract to give yourself a high five. Yay! Now that we have an understanding of the normal anatomy of the spinal cord, let's reinforce everything we've learned by taking a closer look at what happens when something goes wrong. The simplest kind of spinal cord injury to understand is a complete spinal injury, in which all function below the level of the lesion is lost. For example, someone who sustains a complete injury at the level of their chest will likely lose all sensory and motor ability in their legs. However, they will retain these abilities in their arms. This is because the spinal nerves for the upper extremities have already exited the spinal cord in the neck, while those traveling to the legs have yet to depart. In cases of incomplete spinal injury, however, only a part of the spinal cord has been damaged, so some functions will be lost while others will be retained. It is the specific distribution of abilities and deficits across various parts of the body that allows us to localize where in the spinal cord the injury has occurred. For example, an injury to the front half of the spinal cord 
known as an anterior cord injury, causes a loss of motor function as well as crude touch, temperature, and pain sensation below the level of the lesion. Recall that the spinothalamic tract not only travels in the anterior portion, it also crosses over there in the anterior white commissure, so an anterior injury will lead to loss of crude touch, temperature, and pain sensation. While the lateral corticospinal tract is found more in the posterior portion of the spinal cord, the motor neurons that emerge from these tracts then go to the anterior horn, leaving them prone to this form of injury as well. However, the key here is that fine touch, pressure, and proprioception remain intact as epicritic neurons travel in the dorsal columns towards the back. However, the same can't be said for an injury of the posterior spinal cord, as the exact opposite pattern will be seen here. The primary deficits are in the sensory modalities of fine touch, vibration, and proprioception below the level of the injury, while crude touch, temperature, and pain sensation, as well as motor functioning, all remain intact. Knowing what happens when an injury to the center of the spinal cord occurs will test your knowledge of which structures are more medial and which are more lateral. More medial structures will be most affected, while lateral structures will be largely intact. For the motor system, that means that there will be greater weakness of the arms compared to the legs, as the motor neurons traveling to the arms are medial to those traveling to the legs. Protopathic sensory loss below the level of the injury is often seen as well, due to the proximity of the spinothalamic tract to the center of the spinal cord, with arms affected more than legs. Epicritic sensation is often spared as the bulk of the neurons are found to the back of the spinal cord rather than at the center. brown saccard syndrome occurs when one half of the spinal cord, either the right or the left, is injured more than the other. For this reason, motor function as well as fine touch, vibration, and proprioception are compromised on the same side as the lesion, while crude touch, temperature, and pain are affected on the opposite side. This is because the nerves carrying non-discriminative touch, temperature, and pain are not that patient and want to cross over immediately. You can try to remember this by thinking that brown saccard syndrome is what happens when someone tries to backstab you but only does it halfway. Finally, we'll talk about cauda equina syndrome. While intuitively it would make sense that the nerves coming out of the cauda equina would go to the lowest part of the body, such as the feet, in reality these nerves instead travel to the pubic and anal areas. This is because the nerves coming out of the spine are arranged as if we were walking around on all fours like a dog or a cat, rather than in the standing position. For this reason, cauda equina syndrome leads to deficits in both motor and sensory function in the pelvic region, including loss of bowel and bladder control, muscle paralysis, and lower reflexes in the lower body, as well as numbness around the perineum. This is sometimes called saddle anesthesia because the numbness is in the same area that would be in contact with a horse's saddle. It's pretty easy to use some mental imagery to connect an injury in the horse's tail with a saddle distribution. And with that, we've covered the organization of the spinal cord. Make sure you have a solid understanding of the three pathways we've covered in this video. The dorsal column medial lumniscus pathway that carries fine touch, vibration, and proprioception. The spinothalamic tract carrying non-discriminative touch, temperature, and pain sensation, and the corticospinal tract carrying motor impulses from the brain to the muscles. Let's use a few mnemonics to tie these together. To remember the corticospinal tract, think of a teacher trying to explain the role of pyramids in the corticospinal tract. They may say the phrase, flexing involves pyramids. The student, however, would probably be confused about what pyramids have to do with any of this and may respond with, come again? These five words should help you remember the frontal lobe, the internal capsule, and in particular the posterior limb, the pyramidal decussation in the medulla, the corticospinal tract in the spinal cord, and finally, the anterior horn, or the lower wing of the butterfly. To remember the spinothalamic tract, you can use the mnemonic, list some proper avenues for sending temperature and pain, which stands for Lissauer's tract, the substantia gelatinosa and nucleus proprius, the anterior white commissure, the spinothalamic tract, the thalamus, and then finally, the parietal lobe. Use the not that patient mnemonic from before to remind yourself that this tract crosses over immediately in the spinal cord. Finally, the dorsal column medial lumniscus pathway doesn't really need a mnemonic, as the unique elements of this pathway, the dorsal column and the medial lumniscus, are found right in the name. 
Use the feeling very patient mnemonic to remind yourself that this pathway crosses over in the sensory decussation in the medulla. Okay, that's it for this video. I hope the lectures have been helpful so far. If you want more learning materials, including practice questions, consider getting the book Memorable Neurology, which is available on Amazon. Otherwise, you can consider subscribing to be notified when the next video comes out. Until next time, thanks for watching.